Hello everyone and thank you for joining us for session two of the introductory tribal juvenile policy and code development course. Uh, you're here today with us uh, joining the OJGDP Tribal Youth Training and Technical Assistance Center. And if you were with us last time, you know that our presenter is Pat Sika Kwaptua. She is from the University of Alaska Fairbanks and she will be presenting today as a content of session two. We also have joining us Lauren Van Schilfgaard from the Tribal Law and Policy Institute, and she is joining us today to assist in facilitation, but she'll be presenting um, more content in the later session. So we want to welcome both of them for joining us again and welcome all of you uh, who have joined us. If you are not here for session one, we will let you know when session one is archived and available for viewing, um, but we're glad that you're here for session two. So we're going to get started. Uh, we want to welcome you all and take a minute uh, for those who may still be joining us online. And so in the interim, uh, we just want to say a, a welcome from the TA Center, from our staff here. Uh, we have staff in Oklahoma City, Oklahoma, and then we have several remote staff across the country. So welcome. Uh, we wanted, if you're able to, in the chat box on the bottom left, uh, just to share one word or something that you're wanting to learn today. Um, in regards to the topic, which is um, the philosophy of the tribal juvenile justice system and any expectations you have about what you wanted to learn today or a topic of discussion that you would uh, like to address at some point during this webinar. So in the bottom left chat box, just something you're thinking about learning today, something you'd hope to learn about today. Um, or something you've been wondering about in the development of your tribal juvenile justice system or in developing your tribal code. So this is just a time to share. And I see that people are typing, so we'll give everyone a minute to think. Um, if you just want to share where you're joining from and uh, something that's been on your mind in regards to the work that you're doing, uh, we're happy to share that as well. Uh, for those of you that are OJJDP Tribal uh, Purpose Area 8 or Purpose Area 9 grantees, I did want to send you a reminder that uh, if you would like our presenter, Pat, to um, review your Tribal Healing to Wellness um, policy, procedure, code, or even if you don't have a Healing to Wellness court but you're working on general uh, juvenile code development, uh, there are opportunities for um, Pat to review and provide a bit of consultation. Um, her bio is located in the presentation for download box, and her email is there. And then we'll also bring it up at the end. Um, but you can contact us at the TA Center, or you can email directly to Pat um, to confer specifically about your juvenile codes or your policies or procedures that you're currently working on. So I see several of you are sharing. Uh, hello to those who are joining from the Navajo Nation. I see Bentley Brem shared uh, cultural approaches and viewpoints. And uh, thank you for sharing that. I know that that's probably something we'll discuss today is um, differing viewpoints and approaches when we're developing justice systems and justice processes. And I see several of you are um, sharing. Uh, we'll come back to this. And uh, I want to move on. We have a lot of content to cover today. So uh, thank you all for those of you who share. Continue to share in the chat box. And we'll revisit that occasionally um, when we take um, breaks from the content. Nick, if you want to do the tech on the webinar, feel free to enter that into the chat box, and we'll assist you. So today we're going to be uh, discussing um, philosophy related to the development of the tribal juvenile justice system. Pat is going to go over our learning objectives shortly. Um, and we've already moved past session one, which was reforming um, your tribal juvenile justice system big picture considerations. Uh, we're here at the 
OJJDP Tribal Youth Training and Technical Assistance Center. We are located at the University of Oklahoma Health Sciences Center, and our contact information is below. Uh, you can visit our website anytime to look at resources and information related to tribal juvenile justice development. And that's just a quick look at our website. Feel free to visit us anytime. If you have any training or technical assistance needs, you can also request it there. Um, so we're going to go ahead and do an opening poll just to gauge who's in the audience and get some feedback. Um, Nick, if you could pull up poll question one. And this is just to assess where you all are at in the development process. We have a few questions related to um, the content material for today, and your feedback will help uh, shape additional sessions of this webinar series. So if you see the question, it's what do you think that the Native tribal community would see as the most important goal for court-involved youth? And so when we look at the development of the justice system, it's to, to respond, obviously, to the needs of the community and the needs of youth. And we know that there are some core um, responses for how we um, engage with youth in the justice system. And so out of these, what um, do you think is the most important goal for court-involved youth? And I see that a vast majority that are responding are um, in favor of rehabilitation. That's the goal, one of the main goals, accountability, and public safety. And Pat, are those the responses that you were expecting? They are, given um, the training that's available out there right now for juvenile justice systems. This is really an array of approaches that have historically changed over the years. And rehabilitation was the original one, and we've come back around to it again. Um, I'm sure I'm impacting the answers now at this point. <laughs> well, thank you all for your feedback there. And Nick, you can pull that over. We do have a second poll question. You can go ahead. Uh, yeah, go ahead and pull that one out. OK. We just want to get your feedback on this question. Do you think that the tribal juvenile justice and criminal justice systems should treat young adults 17 to 24 differently than children and adults? And we don't have a why box, but if you respond and you have thoughts on that, feel free to, to chat that in the chat box. So I see that you all, um, looking at this, I see both. I'm wondering if those responses were, I think this question went more specifically to healing to wellness, so sorry if there was any confusion there on that. Um, so we're going to go back to another question. Nick, you can pull that poll back over. Um, just in the chat box, if you guys have time to think about this question, um, on poll one we talked about the differing goals of the justice system, which were um, rehabilitation, retribution, accountability, deterrence, restitution, or public safety. Um, do you think that the goals that you want to implement within the tribal juvenile justice system are different than that of the Western juvenile justice system goals? So that's just some um, feedback for the chat box. Um, what are the goals of your tribal juvenile justice system? If you want to share that, um, we'd love to know your responses and um, be able to uh, provide you all some feedback with um, differing approaches from communities. And so with that, um, this is just to generate some conversation from the group and to get some feedback uh, to see the differing approaches within your communities and really just to um, provide us with um, the ability to shape the sessions to meet your all needs. So with that, we're going to proceed into the
session objectives. And Pat, I'm going to let you go through those and then get started. OK, thank you, Anna. So our learning objectives today are to really understand what is meant by adolescent brain development from the perspective of science, and, and then to ask questions about what the impact of this information should be on how we reform our juvenile policies and law. And this is not just a question for tribal juvenile justice systems. This is also a question for the state juvenile justice systems. We'll also um, survey the, histor the historical approaches to juvenile justice. And then, of course, we'll look at the implications and findings, um, the implications of both this historical approach and the uh, science on adolescent brain development on the findings and purpose statements in tribal juvenile laws. And we'll look at the model codes, both the 1989 and the 2016 codes at the very end of our presentation today. All right, so um, our opening slide and title for this session is Philosophy of Juvenile Justice System. The big question um, for us to explore today is what do we want the goals of our juvenile justice system to be? And in order to answer that question, we have to look at the different philosophical approaches. So on your slide 11, hopefully, uh, you're seeing um, three circles. And what I hope to do is to sort of walk through these different arenas of uh, justice or uh, and, and talk about how they overlap to inform today's juvenile justice arena. So I'm going to start with the criminal justice arena. And I'm going to talk about some of the goals and principles that we see bubbling up from the criminal justice perspective. And the first concept is something called culpability. And it's also known as blameworthiness. To, to what extent is uh, a youth, or anyone for that matter, who commits a wrong act blameworthy for the wrong act? Another concept in the criminal justice arena is proportionality. And this is the idea that punishment should fit the crime that punishment should not be wildly disproportionate from the crime. A third concept here is that of deterrence. And deterrence comes in two forms. One is called specific deterrence, and the other is called general deterrence. Both of these deal with the idea that punishment, that, um, that you can set out certain punishments that might prevent the commission of future crimes. If we're talking about specific deterrence, this is with respect to the individual youth or person themselves. And if we're talking about a society at large, sometimes you can make a punishment for a crime that might deter anyone from committing that crime in the future. So deterrence is also an important concept in criminal justice. The fourth is restitution. And this is the idea that um, a perpetrator should have to pay uh, or make up for harm done to a victim or society at large for whatever harm they caused. And we see a lot of talk about restitution in tribal courts. The next concept is public safety. And this is about um, the government or the tribal government's duty to preserve the public or community safety. And we also see uh, in, present, in the present day a lot of talk about public safety. And then finally, there's a lot of, um, there are a lot of principles surrounding rights and due process in criminal justice. Uh, these deal with fairness, fair process. Uh, if we're in a tribal context, we're also talking about protection of individual rights under either the tribal constitution or the Indian Civil Rights Act. So these are important goals and principles in the criminal justice arena, which is very much concerned with fairness, justice, and safety. All right, so I'm going to walk us over to this other circle or this other arena that I'm calling the welfare and social control arena. 
And I was trying to think about what is this? This is kind of the kitchen sink of law policies and interventions involving youth that is not purely criminal justice. Um, and its origins stem you know, from the late 1800s from religion and religious principles and reformers who are basing their um, juvenile justice reforms on those principles to all the way to the current day or present day where we're actually looking at science and what its implications are for juvenile justice. So in the beginning, in this welfare and social control arena, um, the focus was really on rehabilitation. And the old definition, and I mean like the late 1800s definition of rehabilitation, was about helping a person to readapt to society or restoring them to their former position. And today we see it. Uh, rehabilitation being defined to really be much more about treatment, uh, case management, and other therapeutic interventions. So over the years, um, the focus of the policies in this arena have shifted. So they went from rehabilitation to retribution, which is very much about punishment for uh, wrong or criminal acts, and then to accountability. And then today, um, you might just mentally write in a fourth term there called the developmental approach. And it shifted um, between accountability, uh, or I should say between the era of retribution and the developmental approach today, the definition of accountability shifted. So today, we tend to think of accountability as applying consequences and sanctions to youth. Um, that, that are swift, sure, consistent, and graduated. So there's, there's really more of a therapeutic aspect to the sanctions. It's not all about punishing for vengeance for the commission of a wrongful act. Also, today, accountability includes um, working with you to help them see victims as people and to help them repair the damage done, to give them opportunities to make things right. OK, so then let's go up to our third circle here, which is the arena of science. And specifically, we're looking at research from the social, behavioral, and neurosciences. And of course, science is all about understanding things. Um, but in the context of juvenile justice, we're looking at the science of adolescent brain development and behavior. And it seems that the interest is really on the stages of adolescent brain development and what that means for how we should draft our juvenile laws. Also, there's a focus on you know, what is the changeability of youth at these different stages. Uh, you know, how, how can they um, change their behavior? And what is the potential for that behavior change? And then finally, um, we're looking at effective interventions for therapeutic and other purposes when we're looking at the science. So I put this sort of big picture slide together because those of us who work in native circles and in tribal justice circles, we often find ourselves stepping back and asking, you know, our, are our goals in our tribal systems the same? Um, are they the same as the criminal justice system goals, as um, more general state welfare and social control goals? Are they the same as what, you know, the goals of the science are? Um, you know, might we have a different outlook? And I don't know the answer to that question. I do know that our communities are very concerned with the health and welfare of our people. I know that we're concerned with having control over our futures. Um, I know we're very much prioritizing Native values and life ways. And that we tend to look at relationships between people and the duties and responsibilities owed between them. So I just give you these, these different arenas to sort of think about as a backdrop to the presentations that follow. Uh, and, and to think about how these different goals and principles are influencing juvenile justice policy and whether they make sense in a tribal context. 
Okay. So a little bit about where all this information is coming from. Um, I'm going to do a set of slides on the history of the juvenile court and the philosophical approaches. This information is taken from a book by Elizabeth Scott and Lawrence Steinberg called Rethinking Juvenile Justice. And you will see, if you research the adolescent development literature, that we see Lawrence Steinberg quite a bit. And he received his PhD in developmental psychology from Cornell University. He's a leading expert on uh, psycho the psychological development during adolescence. Uh, he also currently is an assistant professor of psychology at Harvard and their Center for Law, Brain, and Behavior. He's a former president of the Division of Developmental Psychology for the American Psychological Association and also the Society for Research on Adolescence. And then he was also the lead scientist um, for several amicus briefs that were filed before the U.S. Supreme Court, uh, specifically the Roper versus Simmons case, which abolished the death penalty for juveniles. So this is the guy, this is the man. You'll want to Google him to find more of his articles if you're interested. And let's just take a look at how he viewed the history of the juvenile court system. Okay, so there's really two different views almost from the beginning about what juvenile, how juveniles should be treated by the court systems. So I have a quote on the left-hand side here from Judge Julian Mack, who was very much of the rehabilitative approach. And he says, why is it not just and proper to treat these juvenile offenders as we deal with neglected children? as a wise and merciful father handles his own child whose errors are not discovered by the authorities. So really a view that um, the courts should sit like parents and treat youth of all ages like children. Uh, and that's, that's one view of how the juvenile justice system should function. Now let's contrast that to Mr. Albert uh, Regnery here. He says, that juvenile offenders are criminals who happen to be young. They're not children who happen to be criminal. So a really uh, contrasting view here of how we should view youth and how the system should view youth. And you know, uh, we talked about in session one that opening question about whether or not um, we were seeing uh, misconduct by youth as symptoms of something that could be cured or whether we were seeing uh, a criminal in the making, you know, criminal conduct and criminal, um, a criminal in the making. And we see that theme here again. And this uh, is the late 1800s, early 1900s. Okay, next slide. So during the early 1900s, we see the establishment of the first juvenile court. And they were established by progressives, and this is known as the progressive era and the progressive agenda. The mission of these early juvenile courts was to promote the welfare of youth who were involved in crime and that of children whose parents failed to provide proper care. So what I found interesting about this history is that um, it gives us some explanation as to why so many tribes have conflated uh, tribal codes that conflate the child maltreatment law with the juvenile status offender and juvenile offender law. Um, this conflation starts at the very beginning of the juvenile um, court movement. And Probably what happened is that states drafted their law that way and then tribes copied it, and that's probably how we end up with this sandwiched set of laws. So the goal of the early juvenile court was to expand the boundary of childhood to include adolescents. That means we're not just going to treat young children as children, but the reformers wanted to also see adolescents and, and um, as children and have the system treat them that way. 
prior to um, these reforms, children as young as seven were uh, treated as adults and handled in the adult criminal court system, and they could even be incarcerated. So the goal of the reformers here was to um, increase the age range of youth who could be considered children and treated like children in the system. They also envisioned a court and correctional system uh, in which older as well as younger youth could receive re rehabilitation instead of punishment. And um, I give you uh, Miriam Van Waters here, just a quote from her. She says, the child of proper age to be under the jurisdiction of the juvenile court is encircled by the arm of the state, which, as a sheltering wise parent, assumes guardianship and has power to shield the child from the rigors of the common law and from neglect or depravity of adults. So again, very much focused on treating youth as children and having the court system look after them like parents. All right, so the really big challenge for these progressive era reformers is that they had to change the PR on how people think about, how people thought about uh, young people, um, older youth, um, and to change their image from one of being young criminals to being, you know, deserving of all the sympathy and paternalistic attention of the juvenile court system. And um, Dr. Steinberg talks about how this was a really hard sell even then, um, and that there was a use of a lot of romantic rhetoric um, that these young people were innocent, they didn't have adequate parental supervision, they were falling prey to evil influences. So even from the beginning, there was this tension about how we should view um, young offenders who are not children. All right, so some people during this early era argued that the progressive reformers had mixed intentions. They said, well, yeah, sure, they're concerned about child welfare, but they also have a social control agenda, and that agenda is to Americanize immigrant youth and to minimize the influence of poor, urban, often foreign parents on their children. And I can't help but think that this, this, there's some um, similarities here from this era, because we're in the federal Indian law era of allotment and assimilation here in the overlap. And we see uh, some of that um, social um, control agenda with respect to Native children as well. Think boarding schools, for example. So there may be something to this critique of the, of the progressive era reformers who wanted to set up the juvenile courts and the juvenile justice system. However, Dr. Steinberg stresses that we need to remember that these progressive reformers also had faith in the effectiveness of rehabilitation. And during this time, the profession of social work was established. Um, psychiatry and psychology emerged as scientific disciplines. There was a lot of optimism about the potential to understand human behavior and to treat pathological conditions. So they really did believe that by using uh, science and knowledge and expertise, there's a basis for treatment and that it could be used to help delinquent youth change their ways. So this rehabilitative model that the reformers, the progressive era reformers put forth, ended up shaping the operation of the juvenile courts in the 20th century. Uh, and as I mentioned before, before 1900, youth crime was addressed by the adult criminal system. But by 19, um, let's say 1889, the first juvenile court was established in Chicago, Illinois. And by 1925, we see juvenile courts in almost every state. 
Okay, so how did this rehabilitative model influence different aspects of what we now see as the juvenile court system? Well, remember that the goal of the rehabilitative model is treatment. So it influenced the process of juvenile court um, by stressing that it be an informal process and that there was no need for procedural safeguards. Now remember, I'm talking about the early 1900s here. It also influenced the process of adjudication. And you might ask, what are we talking about when we say adjudication? Well, remember, it's that process that looks like a trial in the juvenile uh, code. Um, it's where the judge holds a hearing and, and takes uh, evidence on whether or not a specific youth committed a juvenile offense or whether um, a youth and his family or a family in need of services. Um, so today we, we know of this or think of this as a hearing or trial process. Um, in the early 1900s, they treated this adjudication process very informally. They said, okay, this is not a criminal trial. So um, we don't need to have an adversarial hearing. Um, and the purpose of the hearing was just to figure out whether um, what the sources of the child's criminal conduct was and to determine you know, how they should correct or dispose of this youth you know, to set him on the right path. And uh, often it was things like um, putting the youth in a, a work or a reform uh, institution. And it was a very different definition of treatment or rehabilitation from what we see today. OK, so another aspect of the process that was impacted by the rehabilitative model is um, disposition. And remember, this is the part of the juvenile code or process where You've had a hearing to determine that the child is a juvenile offender um, or a family in need of services. And then there's a second hearing where the judge is going to decide how to dispose of the case and what to order for the youth. So in the early 1900s, um, these delinquency dispositions were very open-ended and indeterminate. Um, so, I mean, that made sense because, you know, treatment should end when the youth is cured. And, you know, so they could go on and on. Also, the duration of, you know, how long that court exercised jurisdiction over the youth, for example, had no relation to the seriousness of the offense. So there was no sense of, well, you know, does the punishment fit the crime? There was no sense of proportionality here um, because it was a treatment-focused model or a rehabilitation-focused model, and it was all about curing the patient. Also, juvenile court judges were very uh, free to order dispositions that were based on their judgment about what the youth needed. And they really didn't look at the seriousness of the criminal conduct here. OK, so I just wanted to note at the bottom of this slide on the right that um, in the Chicago juvenile justice system, for example, um, they wanted to authorize judges to be able to find youth delinquent, dependent, or neglected. And they wanted to encourage alternatives to jail. Don't throw them in jail. Uh, let's put them on probation at home, or put them in a foster home, or let's place them in a training school or a reformatory. Uh, this is the kind of rehabilitation that they had in mind. OK, so let's go and look at some of the roles that got impacted in the juvenile justice system here. So the rehabilitative model and its goal of treatment also impacted the way that the roles of people in the justice system, um, how, they, how they functioned. So there was a view that the judge, probation officers, and social workers should all work together on the youth's behalf. Um, I, I find it interesting that today's um, tribal juvenile healing to wellness court systems are, are based on teams, right, with the judge, 
and um, the probation officer and the, the, all the different roles within that system. Um, also, in this 1900 system, uh, mental health professionals were expected to diagnose and prescribe treatment. So there was some treatment in addition to those reform schools in the big cities. Uh, in, outside of the big cities, they might not have had these professionals. Also, there was no need for a defense attorney, um, and there was no need, apparently, for juvenile judges to have legal training. So a lot of what we think of in uh, contemporary criminal justice um, process was not present in these juvenile courts in the 1900s, in the early 1900s. Okay, so by 1925, every uh, state had established a separate juvenile justice system. And then the states went about 70 years where juvenile courts operated with these informal procedures, with the proclaimed purpose of offering rehabilitation to children who were involved in crime. And then by the 1960s, the rehabilitative model started to crumble. And then in the 70s, it was really in disrepute. It had pretty much collapsed, and it created a conceptual vacuum as to what was the purpose and what was the rhyme or reason for these juvenile justice systems. Um, Dr. Steinberg points out that the first uh, assault against the juvenile court as they had known it was actually launched by youth advocates who were claiming that adolescents charged with crimes were getting a bad deal. Um, it was a system that was designed to serve them and proclaimed to serve juvenile, juveniles, but it was failing them because it um, failed to provide treatment, but it maintained the myth that rehabilitation was its purpose, and it was also the justification for denying juveniles the procedural rights given to adult criminal defendants. So they didn't have rights in this system. They were um, supposed to be receiving treatment, which they weren't getting. Um, and yet the system was proclaimed to be about rehabilitation. So that was the first attack on the system. So there is a landmark US Supreme Court case called In Re Gold. And it came down in 1967. Uh, let me tell you a little bit about the case before we read the slide. So uh, it involved a 15-year-old boy named Gerald Galt, and he was arrested for making a lewd phone call to his next-door neighbor. And they, they were described as being of the irritatingly offensive adolescent sex variety. So he was brought, Gerald was brought before a juvenile court judge. He wasn't given any notice of the charges against him. He didn't have an attorney. His neighbor never appeared in court as a witness. But instead, the arresting officer testified describing what the neighbor had reported. So the juvenile court judge in this case committed Gerald to the Arizona State Industrial School for up to six years. And this is a crime that would have carried about two months in jail and a $50 fine if it had been committed by an adult. So really a disproportionate uh, penalty here for making a lewd phone call. So Gerald appealed and ultimately prevailed in the US Supreme Court. And in an opinion written by Justice Fortas, he flatly rejected the state justification for the informality of the delinquency proceedings. And he described the court process as a kangaroo court. He noted that delinquents generally got little rehabilitation, and what they received was ineffective as evidenced by the high recidivism rate in juvenile crime. OK, so um, let's come back to our slide here. So Galt is known for extending due process protections to youth in delinquency proceedings. It really restructured the way that state courts held their um, court process. And of course, their laws changed as well. Um, so 
concluded here that you facing adjudication, remember they're like trials, in delinquency proceedings, like adult criminal defendants, they face the loss of liberty and thus were entitled to certain due process protections as mandated by the 14th Amendment of the U.S. Constitution. So juveniles, like adults, now always did actually have a right to notice of the charges. They had a right to confront the witnesses against them. They had a privilege against self-incrimination and a right to counsel. Um, so we're going to talk about this more in another session when we look more specifically at how this impacts the provisions in tribal juvenile codes. But for now, you just need to remember that in 1967, there was this big U.S. Supreme Court case that really restructured um, how much process and the types of process that juvenile courts had to, had to follow in the state systems. Okay, next slide. So Dr. Steinberg asks, what went wrong with the rehabilitative model here? Um, and he, he ultimately says that it failed to recognize and, and accommodate attention here. And it's attention in the interest that a government should be promoting here. So on the one hand, a government has the purpose of acting in the interest of young offenders, right? We, we, they're looking out in a parental way for the welfare of youth. On the other hand, a government also has an interest in retribution, punishment, and in protecting society against those who engage in criminal conduct. So uh, the rehabilitative model did not accommodate um, policy and law possibilities for both of these interests. It only focused on the first one, which was uh, acting in the interest of young offenders. And, and the public and others uh, would not allow this tension to stand, or not allow that uh, maybe imbalance to remain. OK, so there was a big wave of reform then after Galt. And Part of this is due to um, inherent problems with the rehabilitative model, but also that there were just big changes going on in society, um, notably an increase in crime, a real uptick in crime in the 80s, mid-80s to early 90s. So by the 1980s and 1990s, uh, lawmakers that had the primary goal of protecting the public and punishing offenders, they started to shift the boundary of childhood downward. That means they started to subject younger and younger youth to uh, adult criminal court process. And their goals had shifted, right? They were no longer um, trying to rehabilitate youth and protect them but now the goals really shifted in the other direction towards protecting the public and punishing offenses. So there's a number of legislative reforms that we see in the state. And you might ask Professor S, why are you talking so much about state law? Well, the reason is that it bleeds into tribal law. We, we accidentally or accidentally on purpose copy it into our tribal laws over the years. And so we see little bits and pieces of these state law reforms in our tribal laws. And so it's important to know or be able to see what it was originally intended to do so that we can think about whether we want it still to be in our tribal law. And I would look pretty hard at these any state law reforms in the 1980s and the early 1990s because they are, they're very punitive in their approach. All right, so here's sort of a laundry list. And I'll, I'll go over these. Um, let's see, I don't want to go into too much detail, but I want to give you the gist of it. So the first kind of reform has to do with judicial transfers. So usually what you'll see in a juvenile court in a state system is they'll have a provision in the juvenile statute that allows a juvenile judge to consider, to hold a hearing and consider 
whether they'll transfer a young person out of juvenile court into adult criminal court and then have that young person be treated like an adult in the criminal process subject to the adult sanctions. So these transfer hearings used to have age limits. And what these reforms did is they lowered the age limit. So now you might be able to have a 10-year-old in the juvenile court get transferred over into adult criminal court, which is kind of shocking. Another tool is what are called, um, oh, let's talk about it this way. So another way that this is done is that uh, legislatures in the law would give criminal courts automatic jurisdiction over certain youth. Um, and I'm trying to see if I have a good example of this. Um, okay, so an example of this would be used to be that um, you would give a criminal court automatic jurisdiction over certain youth. There'd be no transfer hearing. And it used to be that this could happen for usually um, major crimes. So oh, you know what? I'm going to talk about legislative waiver statutes and direct file statutes. So this is real, these are really the mechanisms that get used primarily. So a legislative waiver statute shifts discretion from the judge to the prosecutors. So prosecutors are given authority to decide whether to charge a youth with a waivable offense, um, meaning uh, an offense that can waive them into adult criminal court, or whether they charge them with a less serious crime over which the juvenile court has jurisdiction. Uh, so think about this. You used to have a scenario where a juvenile judge would have a hearing and decide whether to transfer a young person into adult criminal court. Um, but now the laws have been changed in many states, and instead prosecutors are given the choice of deciding whether or not to charge uh, and file papers against the youth in adult criminal court right away, no transfer hearing. So that's a big difference. Um, and I think I'll leave it at that. So you just get the gist of how these laws are getting more punitive. Also, uh, state legislatures started making laundry lists of transferable offenses or crimes that are subject to these, you know, these mechanisms that we're just now talking about. They also made sanctions harsher and longer. They used more incarceration for youth. And also, um, they extended juvenile court jurisdiction into adulthood, but then they applied what are called blended, blended sentencing statutes. And that's the, um, that allowed juvenile courts to give really long sentences to youth, like you could sentence someone to 40 years, and then they spend a portion of that in juvenile detention, and then when they aged out, they go into um, prison, adult prison. Okay, just let me give a second here and check my messages. Okay, we'll keep going. All right, so I'll check in with you here in a second. I'm almost done with this segment, but I wanted to um, well, Dr. Steinberg points out that some of the lawmaking that came down in the 80s and 90s can be characterized as moral panic. Uh, and let me describe to you some of the scenarios of that time. So in the late, the mid-80s to early 90s, we started to see uh, violent crime rates rise. Uh, and as a result, there were more attacks on the juvenile justice system. At the same time, in the media, we started to see uh, youth depicted as super predators, teenage criminals with no moral, uh, without moral inhibitions who were eager, eager to kill and maim those who came within their paths. So really both um, uh, the reality of, of crime rates going up, media images of youth as super predators, 
And then the, the public started to think of juvenile courts as being too lenient, especially if they were treatment oriented, and that they failed to hold young offenders accountable for their crimes and encourage them to engage in criminal activity. So there was really a sentiment that something had to be done. Dr. Steinberg asks us to do a reality check at this point, however. He points out that in the 1980s, the juvenile court processes and systems had really changed. They had evolved. Um, there were more formalized procedures. There was more um, accountability and public protection at, that was emphasized in the juvenile courts. So he, basically, he's saying that the, um, the response to youth and the rise in crime was a little bit out of whack in time from what was actually going on in juvenile courts. So he talks about law reforms during this period uh, as moral panic. And moral panic is described as where the public, the media, and politicians reinforce each other in an escalating pattern of intense, disproportionate concern in response to a perceived social threat posed by a particular group of individuals, here youth. Um, some examples of moral panic in the past are like the Salem witch trials. Um, some others are episodes of public alarm over illegal drug use, uh, like in the 1960s and the 1980s. Also, there was a moral panic over child sexual abuse in the 1980s and the 1990s. Uh, some of you who are old enough might remember those just wild stories of daycare centers that were like mass sexually exploiting the children in daycare. And a lot of those stories ended up not panning out over time. So I guess the admonition here is to think about um, when we're lawmaking to be sure that we're really basing our law reforms on um, our real assessments of the data in our communities and the needs of our communities as to, opposed to a moral panic, like, oh, these youths are causing all the problems in our system, and if it wasn't but for them, you know, everything would be fine. So we need to, this is a, a cautionary tale, I guess, about lawmaking and just to be alert to the possibility that this can happen. All right, I'm going to pause here for a minute and just check in. Um, do, does anyone have any um, comments or questions that you might want to type into either the chat box or the Q&A box? And Anna, do you have any observations or comments or questions? Um, I would, yeah. I'm glad you said that. Uh, I just wanted to comment to the group. If you have a comment, um, please use the chat box. If you have a specific question, please use the Q&A box, and that way we can differentiate um, general comments from specific questions for Pat to respond to. Um, but I think, you know, I know you had noted, you know, why are we talking about state law, and then we get into the intricacies of, you know, the historical perspectives on juvenile justice. And I think it's really important because I was seeing um, the present day context when you were talking about um, judges having the capability to uh, put youth into re rehabilitative programs. And so that's exactly, if you're developing a juvenile healing to wellness court <clears throat> today, thinking about the perspectives and some of those conflicts like um, the wellness court process being a more intensive and lengthier um, program than, you know, a, a three-day um, stint in juvenile detention. And so when we look at, you know, what is our real purpose, what is our real goal here, well, if it's easier for a youth to go to jail for a few days, if it's easier for them, is that really resolving the, the greater issue for the individual and for the community, which is um, continued dependence on um, alcohol or drugs? And so it's important to understand what is the goal of your system, why is your judicial staff going to make the decisions that they're making, um, and to really put your heads together as a team um, to identify what are what is the true goal of your system, why are you doing what you're doing, and to understand it within the context um, and this historic, historical perspective. So I appreciate um, what Pat shared so far. Thanks, Anna. 
All right. I am not seeing any typing at this point. Um, I just can a note to Anna, uh, in the last session I wasn't able to see if people were asking questions, so you might want to prompt me. Oh, I do see one now. Okay. Yep, we have one question. Let's pull that up. Do you see a parallel with current opioid meth crisis and public outcry for action as moral panic? Possibly. Um, one of the things I noticed that happens is that there will be a real problem in, in a few tribal communities and we're able to lobby for a response and funding from the federal government and then they apply training and policy over a whole bunch of different tribes. But not all tribes have the same problems. So it may be that, you know, this is a call for really doing a, a hard assessment of what you're what your issues are and what your needs are in your specific community. Um, otherwise, we just don't know if we're in the realm of moral panic or, or just the completely, um, you know, the, the cure we're seeking to apply doesn't even fit the symptoms of the problem that we're having. Um, we're, in this series, we're really looking at uh, statutory provisions and law reform. But uh, I definitely would talk to your TA providers about how to do assessments about what your community needs in the areas of, of both law reform and services and treatment. All right. So I am going to shift topics here now. And we're going to talk about the science of adolescent brain development and what its implications are for legal policy. What are its implications for how we should draft our tribal laws? Um, and as I do this, I want to, I really want to focus you in on the developmental stages that appear to be arising as a result of the science. I do see that a lot of people, uh, even the experts, don't want to lock down any concrete ages, but I am able to discern from all the research that I've done that there are some age ranges that they're talking about. So there's three categories that, or three terms that you should use. Um, and these are thought of as different developmental stages. So the first term is child. And it looks like anyone under the age of 10 is definitely considered a child. And then there's sort of a blurry area between 10 and 12. So I'm going to, for my purposes today, when I say child, I mean ages 0 to 12. The second term is the term adolescent. And the age range that I'm going to assign to that based on the research I've done is ages 12 to 17. And then the third term is young adult. And the age range for young adults for today's purposes is 18 to 24. Or sometimes you'll hear people say, um, you know, adolescent brain development is going full force between ages 12 and uh, 25. Um, so I'm, I'm saying that young adult is 18 to 24 because when they hit that 25th year, um, 25th birthday, that's the day that it sort of ends. Um, nobody wants to lock down really hard age ranges, but there are some sort of background ranges for child, adolescent, and young adult. And I just wanted to give you a sense of what those ranges are before we start talking. OK. So let's go ahead um, and look at sort of the big points that are coming out of this. So again, this material is taken from Dr. Steinberg's um, lectures with the, the Harvard group that he's been working with. Uh, and I can see sort of five pertinent areas for our purposes, um, areas that are impacted by the science on adolescent brain development. The first is the age boundaries that I just gave you. And the question would arise then, should we be treating youth differently based on their age boundary. Are they a child? Are they an adolescent? Are they a young adult? Um, what are the implications for the children's code, the juvenile code, 
Um, should there be a special piece of law for young adults that doesn't exist yet um, in that age range between um, <laughs> the very last uh, age range that I gave you for young adults between 18 and 24? So that's the first um, point here. The second is judicial discretion. So the question here is, you know, how much leeway should uh, a tribal legislature give to the tribal judge when they draft the law? Should they give the judge more discretion to, you know, hold hearings and make case-by-case -case dispositions for youth based on the unique circumstances of that youth? Or should they, you know, set really strict um, um, powers and treatment over youth based on these age ranges? And Dr. Steinberg argues for more judicial discretion. He says, even though the science of adolescent development is telling us a lot about what's going on in their brains between 12 and, and 25, the science cannot tell us at the moment at which an adolescent brain turns into an adult brain. Um, and of course, not every child is going to fit the age range that's generalized. And so judges need to be given discretion to be able to assess things on a case-by-case -case basis and that we shouldn't hardwire things into the law that will get in the way of that. The third point here has to do with sentencing. And uh, we'll say a lot more about that in the next few slides. There's two things going on here. Um, one is culpability, blameworthiness. Uh, and they're finding that youth, um, because of the underdeveloped brains that they have in adolescence, are less culpable. And so it makes it harder um, to punish them harshly because of the proportionality requirements in our criminal justice principles. So it seems unfair to give a harsh punishment to a young person whose brain is causing them to be less brain blameworthy for committing an act. Uh, and so that's going to impact sentencing. Indeed, the US Supreme Court has said no death penalty for young, uh, for adolescents because of their underdeveloped brains. And also, um, they're starting to look very hard and, and also say no life without parole. Uh, and I anticipate they'll start to say no very long sentences at some point in the state court system. The fourth point here has to do with education and corrections, um, both positive and negative. Um, they're finding that because of the way that the adolescent brain is developing at certain stages, young people are very sensitive to rewards. And they're also, their brains are very much, um, they, call, they call it plastic or plasticity. They, their brains are um, very much uh, developing, they're learning. Um, it's a point in life where you can do a lot of learning and you can really change your brain. So if you're putting young people in detention, uh, in secure detention or prison at this point, um, you are really in, you're really hardwiring their brains in, in certain directions. Uh, and it's a time when they need to be learning certain things and they need to not be learning certain things. So there's uh, the point from Dr. Steinberg here is that our correctional systems are not set up to adequately educate adolescents, so adolescents should not be in those correction systems unless that education system is there. Also, it may be disfavored anyway because you don't want to mix them in with other folks who are going to teach them things that you don't want them to learn. OK, so the fifth point here is this question. Should adolescents have a right to an intact brain? In other words, um, is the system interfering with their wiring of their brain at a time when you know this is their one shot to wire their brain in a certain way? And this really has bigger implications for um, how people would argue appeals or argue cases before the US Supreme Court with respect to how young people are treated in sentencing and um, and what happens to them in the system. So that's a bigger bigger question. Um, 
that they're exploring more at Harvard right now. And I give you the links to these lectures in, I think it's slide 50 of this set. You can go and listen to them yourself. All right, next slide. All righty, so I premise or I, I, I give you the, <laughs> the initial statement here that I am not a neuroscientist. And I'm having to learn this just like you would. Um, and so I'm going to have to be able to walk you through some of the structural changes in the brain during adolescence um, in baby steps, because <clears throat> I, too, am not a neuroscientist. So there's four structural changes that Dr. Steinberg really points out. Um, the first one is that he says, that during adolescence, there's a decrease in the gray matter in the prefrontal, prefrontal regions of the brain. And I'll show you some pictures here in a minute. The second is that there are changes in the neurotransmitters and in dopamine in the brain that are important. The third is that there's an increase in white matter in the prefrontal cortex through a process called myelination. And I'll give you pictures, and we'll, we'll talk about it in baby steps. And then the fourth is that there's an increase in the strength of connections between the prefrontal cortex and other regions of the brain. So these four structural changes in the brain during adolescence have big impacts for how we think about adolescence in the criminal justice system. All right, so let's go to the first slide here. All right, so decrease in gray matter in the prefrontal regions of the brain. So if you look at this picture um, of the very colorful brain at age five and the very blue brain at age 20, so what's happening here is that um, there they're now able to do brain scans that show how the brain matures between the ages of 5 and 20. And the gray matter in our brain decreases in a wave from the back to the front of the brain as unwanted neural connections are pruned. So you can see, I know we're talking about gray matter and white matter. But in this case, the blue indicates a maturing of the brain as gray matter is lost. So as gray matter goes away and white matter increases in our picture or in the scans, it shows up as blue. And so what's going on here? Um, let me just point you to the picture of a neuron, which is that kind of cellular looking thing with, you know, um, long strands coming out of it up here in the right-hand corner. And then each of those, they called nerve fibers, each of those fibers talks to another neuron through its nerve fibers. And where they intersect and talk to each other, it's called a synapse. So we have all of these neurons in our brain talking to each other through these synapses. And so when the gray matter decreases in our brains in the prefrontal region, what's going on is called synaptic pruning. And this is a process where unused connections between neurons, unused synapses are eliminated. And the elimination of these unused synapses occurs primarily during pre-adolescence or childhood and early adolescence. And this is a period during which improvements in basic cognitive abilities and logical reasoning are seen because of these anatomical changes. And so there's another diagram here to the, to the right at the bottom that says, um, by age 11 for girls and 12 for boys, the neurons in the front of the brain have formed thousands of new connections or synapses. Over the next few years, most of these will be pruned. They'll be cut. They'll be done away with. Those that are used and reinforced, um, the pathways involved in language, for example, will be strengthened, while the ones that aren't used will, be, will die out. 
So this is a time when the brain is really rewiring itself um, and also pruning itself. Okay, let's look at the, the second change. And this is the changes in neurotransmitters. So there is a neurotransmitter called dopamine. And it's a chemical that can cross uh, the gap between neurons. Uh, it, it crosses the synapse. And so a nerve impulse travels along the neuron. And when it reaches the end of the neurotransmitter, it's released. And it crosses the synapse. And this allows an impulse to continue between neurons. So there's a lot of different dopamine receptors in the brain. Um, it's thought that dopamine is responsible for a general feeling of well-being. Uh, for example, uh, dopamine has been linked with feelings of happiness and excitement and positivity, as well as the eagerness to go after goals or rewards. Uh, it should be no surprise that certain drugs, um, nicotine and other drugs, also increase dopamine levels in the brain, um, methamphetamine also. Um, so it's, it's a happy neurotransmitter, but it's also a natural neurotransmitter. So during uh, childhood and also around the time, I'm sorry, during early adolescence, and around the time of puberty, there's important changes in activity involving neurotransmitters, specifically dopamine. And there are substantial changes in the density and distribution of dopamine receptors. So I put this little diagram in the lower right-hand corner here. Um, and you're basically seeing a synapse here. And on the right-hand side, is the synapse for the receiving neuron. And you see those little sort of squares with a, with a curve in them? Those are dopamine receptors. So they're receiving dopamine. And then on the left-hand side is the sending neuron. And it's got uh, lots of dopamine. And it's shuffling those off through the synapse to the receiving neuron. So Dr. Steinberg here is, is letting us know that um, there are changes during adolescence here between in the density and distribution of dopamine receptors, which are the pathways that connect the limbic system in the brain um, with the front of the brain or the prefrontal cortex. So I show you a diagram in the middle here. Um, it looks like a, kid, um, a kid's brain. Uh, and then on the front, you see the prefrontal cortex. And then the limbic system is deeper in the brain. And I give you a, a picture of it in the upper right-hand corner here, where you can see that limbic system is really deep down in the brain. So what's going on here, then, is that the pathways that connect the limbic system, where emotions are processed and reward and punishment are experienced, and the prefrontal cortex, um, which is the brain's chief executive officer, um, there are more pathways developing between those two systems. And um, the other point he makes is that dopamine plays a critical role in our experience of pleasure, and that these changes have important implications for sensation-seeking behavior in adolescence. All right, next slide. All right, so increases in white matter in the prefrontal cortex is the next segment. And I just give you here on the right-hand slide a more detailed um, picture of a neuron, which is the big red thing in the, the main body of it here. And then uh, they zoom you in on a synapse in the top circle here. And you see the, the little dopamine receptors and the dopamine between the two synapses. And then I want you to notice this sort of arm that's coming out, this um, nerve fiber that they call it, that's covered in blue. Um, this blue substance is a fatty substance called myelin. And here they're describing it as a myelin sheath or myelination. And the presence of this fatty substance becomes important in increasing white matter in the prefrontal cortex. So let's go to the next slide. 
So according to Dr. Steinberg, a third change in the brain structure is an increase in white matter in the prefrontal cortex. And this is caused by myelination. This is the process where those nerve fiber, fibers become sheathed in myelin, that white fatty substance, and that it improves the efficiency of brain circuits. So this process of myelination happens all the way into somebody's 30s, so um, even beyond our, our young adult category. The more efficient the neural connections within the prefrontal cortex, the, these are important for higher order cognitive functions. Um, and they're regulated by multiple frontal areas working in concert. And it, it provides functions for a person like planning ahead, weighing risks and rewards, and making complicated decisions. All right, so the last category here is the increase in the strength of connections between the prefrontal cortex and other regions of the brain. And because there are greater and stronger connections between these parts of the brain, there's improved connectivity, um, and this is important for a, a, uh, improved connectivity between the prefrontal cortex and the limbic system. And this is important for emotion regulation. It's facilitated by increased crosstalk between the regions of the brain important in the processing of emotional information and those important for self-control. And these gains are ongoing well into somebody's 20s. Uh, and you can see from the diagram on the right here, the prefrontal cortex um, deals with things like empathy, insight, emotion regulation, body regulation, morality, intuition, fear modulation, and then the limbic brain, which I've heard referred to as the primitive brain, is more flight, a uh, fight, flight, freeze, stress responses, am I safe, do people want me, the emotions live in the limbic brain. All right. Next slide. OK, there's one more concept that Dr. Steinberg references in his um, lecture, which is really important, actually. Um, and that has to do with brain plasticity. So brain plasticity, or neuroplasticity, deals with the ability of the brain to recognize neural pathways based on new experiences. To put it in layman's terms, how changeable is a person? Can they change? Well, it has to do with neuroplasticity or plasticity here. Um, I found this really pretty picture of a cross section of those nerve fibers that are myelinated. So now they're cut in half. Uh, and this is an image of a mouse nerve. The myelin is in red, so it's, the, it's that sheath that goes around the outside. And it's surrounding individual nerve cells in blue. And they're talking about how um, hormones like estrogen and testosterone are key to the production of myelin, which accelerates brain signals across neurons. Um, as this production continues into a person's 20s, brain plasticity decreases. So they're starting to not, uh, they're starting to not be adolescents anymore. Um, as this happens, the brain becomes less capable of forming new connections. It's less plastic, less changeable. So I guess the lesson here is that uh, adolescents are far more plastic. They're far more changeable or malleable in a way than we are as adults. And this is a time of great opportunity to change um, behavior. OK, so let's leave the structural changes in the brain, which are very um, hard to understand if we don't come from a science background. And let's talk about how it changes, how it, that adolescence is a, an important time of changes in how the brain functions, not just how its structure changes. So there's three topics here, self-regulation, responding to rewards, and response to stimuli. Uh, 
And let's start with self-regulation. Okay, so over the course of early adolescence and into early adulthood, there's a strengthening of activity in the brain system that involves self-regulation. So during tasks that require a great deal of self-control, adults employ a wider network of brain regions than adolescents do. Um, and they can see this in the brain scans. And this makes self-control easier for adults because they're distributing the work across multiple areas of the brain rather than overtaxing a small number of regions in the brain. So these brain systems important to self-control continue to become more effective into the early 20s. So the younger you are, the harder it is for you to control yourself. The second category is about responding to rewards. And there are important changes during adolescence around the time of puberty and that are linked to the impact of sex hormones on the brain um, that affect the way the brain responds to rewards. So when they look at a brain scan of an adolescent that's taken during a task in which individuals are shown rewarding stimuli, I'm going to pause there for a minute. So in this picture on the right-hand side, they put a bunch of adolescents in an MRI machine, and they, um, they had them play video games. And when those adolescents anticipated a large reward in the video game, they were able to see this yellow um, glow or light up in, in the MRA, in the, in the brain scans. Um, so they could actually see activity in the brain that demonstrated the anticipation of a reward. So um, Dr. Steinberg is saying here that when you look at adolescent brain scans that are acquired during a task where individuals are shown rewarding stimuli, things like piles of coins or pictures of smiling faces, you see that the adolescent reward centers in the brain light up more than they do for children and more than they do for adults, especially when they expect something pleasurable to happen or when they actually receive a reward. And this heightened sensitivity to rewards motivates adolescents to engage in acts, even risky acts, when the potential for pleasure is high. Um, I also think this slide has implications for the Tribal to Healing to Wellness Courts and their uh, balancing of sanctions and incentives. Um, you know, often we think um, there must be a sanction for bad conduct, but sometimes we need to think, why don't we um, exploit the fact that adolescents are highly sensitive to rewards so that we can um, motivate them to behave in certain ways. So I think the science here has big implications for the balance of those in uh, the application of sanctions and, and awards or, I'm sorry, um, sanctions and incentives in juvenile healing to wellness courts. All right. Um, let's see if there's more I wanted to add here from Dr. Steinberg. Oh, yes. Okay. So Dr. Steinberg also points out that they've been studying the impact of peers uh, on adolescent brain activity. And what they found is that adolescents' um, hypersensitivity to reward is particularly pronounced when they are with their friends. Um, and this probably explains why adolescent risk-taking, including criminal behavior, so often happens in groups. And it has implications for how we view anti-gang laws and felony murder laws. Um, the state has passed harsher penalties for crimes committed in gangs than, what, you know, than if the individual had done the crime all by himself. Um, also, there are harsher sentences for adolescent bystanders. They may not have been the perpetrator or the primary perpetrator of a crime, um, but they are included in the category of felony murder laws, uh, and they're punished um, just as though they had done the act themselves. 
And so I guess what Dr. Steinberg is saying here is we need to reconsider whether um, these adolescents have the culpability and whether there is proportionality. Um, does the sentence fit the crime here if these adolescent brains are just, um, you know, their brains are running away with them at this age because of their, um, their sort of hypersensitivity to rewards, and particularly in a peer environment. So here's his argument. He says, group situations actually exacerbate the very deficiencies in judgment that are thought to mitigate adolescents' criminal responsibilities. Thus, the logic of punishing group crimes during adolescence more severely than crimes committed alone is antithetical to the general principle that adolescents' developmental immaturity mitigates their culpability. Um, pretty much what I just said before on the last slide, that um, you know, given their hypersensitivity to reward, they are less culpable, and um, especially when they're in a group setting, and that um, we need to look at whether sentences or punishments are disproportionate for them during this age. Okay, so I think this is the last um, change in how the brain functions. It's the response to stimuli. So a third change in brain function over the course of adolescence involves increases in the simultaneous involvement of multiple brain regions in response to arousing stimuli. For example, a picture of an angry or fearful face. So what is their response to arousing stimuli? Also, um, the ability to regulate feelings improves as regions of the brain that govern emotional processing and self-control become more interconnected. So when they're less interconnected, they have trouble regulating their feelings and their responses to these stimuli. So Dr. Steinberg thinks that susceptibility to peer pressure goes down as an adolescent matures into adulthood because then they're better able to put the brakes on the impulses aroused by their friends. It also explains why we become less likely during early adulthood to overreact to perceived threats than we were during adolescence. So what he's saying here is that um, adolescents um, are going to overreact. They're going to be more susceptible to peer pressure. They're going to have trouble regulating their feelings. This is part of their normal adolescent development. All right, so let's come back to those five big points and think a little bit more about what they mean for our purposes. You know, what do they mean for how we want to draft our juvenile laws? The first category was age boundaries, and Dr. Steinberg stresses that Neuroscience cannot tell us exactly when a given adolescent brain actually becomes an adult brain. We can only sort of set these developmental stages in general, but every individual brain is different. Um, nevertheless, in policy and law and as a practical matter, we have to establish age boundaries. Um, we have to decide how much jurisdiction a juvenile court is going to have over people. Is it going to have jurisdiction over them until they're 40 years old? Um, you, you see the need practically for some age boundaries. Um, we have to approximate it somehow. He says that there's a strong argument for treating adolescents, uh, I'm sorry, treating young adults and adolescents differently than children and adults. So remember, some people are talking about age ranges of 12 to 17 for adolescents and then 18 to 24 for young adults. And you're now even starting to see literature on how uh, young adults need to have sort of their own category in terms of jurisdiction over them and the kinds of interventions that you apply to them. Um, and I think some of the links I gave you at the, in the last slide 50 would take you to some of that information. 
The second uh, point was judicial discretion. I think I made this already, and that is that judges, as much as possible, should be given flexibility to treat individual adolescents, adolescents differently based on their individual circumstances. With respect to point three, sentencing, uh, this is interesting. So Dr. Steinberg said, well, what if you have an adult that has some of these same characteristics? You know, are you going to say that they should not be sentenced as harshly because for some reason their brains are undeveloped as well? And he actually thinks that that analogy is not tight, that, that sentencing of adolescents is different because it turns on not only the fact that their adolescent brain is underdeveloped, but also on the fact that they have the ability to change, that we know they're going to mature, most people are going to mature out of adolescence. And so the fact that we have uh, lesser sentencing, uh, less harsh sentencing for adolescents is justified on these sort of dual principles of their underdeveloped brain and the fact that they can change. So if you, if you listen to Dr. Steinberg's lecture all the way to the end, uh, there's some Q&A at the end, and someone asks him this fascinating question. And it has big implications for Native youth. So they ask, well, what about adverse childhood experiences and the fact that it makes the brain less plastic and thus less changeable? How might, what might the implications be for um, sanctioning Native youth that have had many adverse childhood experiences and they're thus, their brains are less able to change? You know, should this have implications? And of course, this creates all kinds of problems for um, civil rights uh, under the U.S. Constitution because, you know, our systems are supposed to treat everybody the same way. So you couldn't, for example, give harsher sentences to minority youth who have experienced many adverse childhood experiences and thus their brains are less plastic and less changeable. Anyway, it opens up all this sort of fascinating and disturbing um, conversation and dialogue about changeability. Okay, so the fourth point uh, has to do with education and corrections. So it's critical that adolescents have positive and effective educational experiences during their adolescence because this is when the brain is the most changeable. Uh, our corrective systems are not set up to do this right now. And so that's going to need some rethinking and reforming. And then finally, the fifth point was the right to an intact brain, question mark. Should adolescents have a constitutional right to an intact brain? Is healthy neurodevelopment a civil right? Um, and the big problem here, and uh, Dr. Steinberg talks about this in answer to questions at the end of his lecture. He says, um, well, you know, here's the problem. In our United States system and in our state systems, we don't guarantee and enforce positive rights like the right to have an effective education. And it seems as though a right to healthy neurodevelopment is, is also a positive right. Um, and I know that many tribes desire to put positive rights in their tribal constitutions. So the question is here, might tribes see this differently? And then what are the implications of actually providing a right to healthy neurodevelopment? That sounds quite expensive to me. Um, nevertheless, we certainly would want that for all of our children. All right, so let me just see if maybe we should pause here for a minute. Okay, so I would like to pause here for a minute. Are there any comments or questions from folks on the call and or Anna? Um, I just I just wanted to comment that you know when we get into these uh, deeper philosophical questions um, that it is good for us to explore that and to definitely 
um, work with your team, if you're a Healing to Wellness Court, um, to work with your team on talking about um, these points that um, Pat moved through. Um, you could even break it down into this exact, um, the five takeaways. And so I think, I think these are really good um, questions to think about, and I appreciate having to, you know, go deeper into our thought processes about how we support um, youth in our court systems. Thank you, Anna. I know this hurts my brain, and it probably hurts your brain, and we have less plastic brains if we're older, so <laughs> sometimes I feel like my brain is going backwards. <laughs> <laughs> I know. Well, when you're talking about, you know, someone raises a brilliant question and just makes your mind go way further into uh, already an abyss, so... Um, you know, I know we can only go so deep on a two-hour webinar, but, you know, there's, there are takeaways from this that you can go back um, and process some of what you're learning today later. And if you have questions, you can always bring those to the next session. Yes, and luckily we have multiple sessions. All right, so I'm going to come back to some simpler points um, that others have noted in the juvenile justice system, other lawyers and judges, um, just and it will reinforce some of what we've already said. So today, uh, state legislatures are reforming their laws in response to the um, developmental science, the adolescent brain development science. And here are some of the things that are being noted. So there's repeated recognition that adolescents are more susceptible to peer, peer influence, they are less oriented to the future, they are more sensitive to short-term rewards, and they are more impulsive. This is just the way they are. They are wired this way. <clears throat> so what might be the implications? Um, these are some older uh, implications here. And like I said, the U.S. Supreme Court is also changing the laws on the big issues like death penalty and life without parole sentences. Um, but here are some sort of um, earlier observations by people in the justice system. So they really are looking at how culpable, how, um, how culpable adolescents are and whether they should be punished less severely than adults. And more and more, um, the answer is they are not as culpable and they should be punished less severely uh, than adults. They also looked at whether um, adolescents under the age of 16 are more likely to be incompetent than adults to stand trial in a criminal court. Um, and they definitely are. They are incapable of understanding the proceedings that they're involved in. They are incapable of consulting meaningfully with their legal counsel. They're incapable of assisting in their own defense. They're finding all kinds of competency issues with younger adolescents. With respect to punitive sanctions, um, they're finding that punitive sanctions do not stop adolescents from breaking the law, and it actually increases recidivism. Um, it might have something to do with rewards, uh, they sense a reward when they are sanctioned. Um, I, and uh, some have talked about this as, you know, youth who are punished harshly or treated as criminals stand out and it makes them more popular amongst their peer group. Um, also, they can learn from juvenile delinquents or adult criminals if they're mixed in with them in uh, secure detention. So there are all kinds of problems with punitive sanctions. They don't work the way we think they work with adolescents. The signals are different, um, and of course, you know, they're learning things from their peers, and if we put them in jail or detention, they're going to learn from those peers. I would add another bullet here, which wasn't in the original array of implications, which is rewards. Rewards or incentives are more effective. Um, and we certainly see this in the juvenile healing to wellness courts that we're just starting to understand 
how we can use rewards to motivate adolescents given how their brains are wired during this age range. Um, and then finally, family-based interventions are always promoted as both effective and cost-effective. All right, let me see. All right, so I wanted to bring us back down to earth now and talk about um, actual code provisions. And, I'm, and I see that I have a note to myself that we're supposed to do poll number three, Anna. Right. Nick, can you bring that over? It'll be the, there we go. Nick's going to bring this over on the screen. And um, do you know what the goals your current tribal juvenile um, law prioritizes in its purpose section? So we, we touched on this briefly earlier um, as a general chat question, but um, do you know currently what the goal of your community's tribal juvenile law is? What is it attempting to accomplish? Um, if you've had the opportunity to review your code with your team or if your current judicial staff who regularly looks at it, um, have you been able to glean um, what you feel that that code is prioritizing? We have a couple of answers so far. Um, I know in a general assessment of some of the um, codes in the communities I have worked in, um, you know, the, it seemed to me that, that the goals were mainly about um, retribution. There wasn't a lot of context for um, rehabilitation. However, you know, the staff, current staff, you know, may have different goals than what a code says currently. Um, if it was drafted um, previously by a different uh, set of people or administration, so you may be walking into a setting where the code was developed, you know, decades ago and you're working with what's in there, um, and this is what you're, you're here for, is to look at the ways to amend or develop it further. So we have a few responses. Some people don't know. Um, rehabilitation, accountability and rehabilitation, um, and a combination of the same accountability, rehabilitation, and openness to restorative justice. So thank you for those of you who are able to share. Um, Nick can go ahead and close that out. Thank you. That's, that's good to know. And also, at this point, then, we're definitely encouraging you to pop open your code and go read it and see what philosophical approach it is promoting. Um, because hopefully this presentation has really um, opened your mind to see the range of possibilities and how some of them are in conflict with each other. Uh, and so you want to be sure that you vouch for the approach that your system is uh, promoting through its laws and provisions. All right, so I wanted to read you something. Um, I didn't get a chance to load it into the PowerPoint set, um, but um, there is a nonprofit um, um, the Robert F. Kennedy National Resource Center for Juvenile Justice has identified seven hallmarks of a developmental approach to juvenile justice. And so your magic words here are developmental approach. That's the current way of looking at juvenile justice system reforms. And then here are the seven things. So accountability without criminalization. So how can you hold youth accountable without making them criminals in your system? Alternatives to just some system, justice system involvement, are there other ways, you know, like teen court or maybe juvenile healing to wellness court? Um, are there other ways that they can get what they need without being processed, especially through a criminal court? The third is individualized responses based on assessment of the needs and risks of the individual. Um, are they getting assessed and are they getting um, the treatment, case management, um, other uh, things that they might need based on their individual needs? 
The fourth is confinement only when necessary for public safety, otherwise no confinement. The fifth is a genuine commitment to fairness in your juvenile justice system. The sixth is sensitivity to disparate treatment. And I think what they're really pointing out here is does your system treat youth of all races, genders, uh, sexual orientation the same? Are they getting treated the same? Or are some of them getting hit a lot harsher, uh, more harshly by your system? And then the last one was family engagement. Um, so those are the seven hallmarks of a developmental approach to juvenile justice. The links on uh, slide 50 should take you to the Robert F. Kennedy National Resource Center for Juvenile Justice, and you can pull the same article that I'm looking at. All right, so let's take a look at the model codes real quick. Let's take a look at the 1989 one, and then we'll look at the 2016. So the purpose statement in the 1989 code um, basically says that the code shall be interpreted and construed to fulfill the following purposes. And the first one is to preserve and retain the unity of the family, to provide for the care, protection, and wholesome mental and physical development of children. So something that really jumps out at me is that we're calling all youth within the jurisdiction of the court here children. Um, so very much like that original rehabilitative model during the progressive era where we're trying to have all youth treated by the system as though they're children. The second purpose is to recognize alcohol and substance abuse as a disease that is preventable and treatable. So again, the rehabilitative model but a more modern version that is recognizing treatment in particular areas. Three, to remove children from committing juvenile offenses, to remove them from the legal consequences of criminal behavior, and to substitute a program of supervision, care, rehabilitation, uh, but consistent with the protection of the tribal community. So that's public safety right there. So this is a more modern version. It's, um, it's not just sort of the original rehabilitative model. It's um, rehabilitation plus accountability, but in a more therapeutic sense, more contemporary sense. And then the fourth is a family environment, uh, and only separating a child when it's necessary for child welfare or public safety. So in all other cases, trying to keep the children with their parents. All right. And then the other provisions here are, uh, the other purpose is um, to separate juvenile offender process from family in need of services process and to provide the appropriate dispositional op uh, options for those two different categories. We talked about this in our last webinar, how you want to have two um, pathways for processing youth and you decide which they fall into. Have they been committing crimes or have they been committing status offenses? Um, and that you should have different pathways with different end results depending on how you sort of triage the youth that go into your system. Um, also, uh, six is a purpose of providing judicial and other procedures where there are fair hearings and where civil and legal rights are enforced. Seven, the purpose of providing a continuum of services for both children and their families that go from you know, prevention to residential treatment uh, with an emphasis on prevention, early intervention, and community-based alternatives. So remember we talked about doors, having doors out of your tribal court process to community-based and other alternatives. And then eight, to provide a forum where an Indian child charged to be delinquent or a status offender may be referred for adjudication or disposition. So basically providing a court process for those two different types of statuses. All right, so I'm looking at the time. Um, I guess what I'll say, I have the, 
slides for the 2016 model code here. If you read through these, you'll see that they really mirror the 1989 provisions, um, perhaps beefed up a bit more on um, rights protections for youth. But otherwise, they're pretty similar. Um, so we do see that we see elements of those early philosophical approaches uh, modernized to include accountability. Um, still, there may be some room for a developmental approach here. Um, particularly with respect to young adults who are in that age range between um, 17 and 24. All right, I'm going to stop the presentation at this point and turn things back over to Anna. Thank you, Pat, and thank you so much for everything that you shared today. Uh, I, I remind you guys, you can download the slides in the presentation for download box. It's right next to the chat box, and in there you can um, see the resources and links to uh, some of the documents that Pat referred to today. Um, additionally, as you know, this is session two. Session three of this um, series will be on Thursday, June 28th at 1 o'clock Central. A reminder that you should register for that session individually, and I'm going to enter that link into the chat box if you want to register for the next session if you have not already. Um, there is going to be an evaluation. We appreciate your feedback. And we also have a poll question for you. Um, we want to open up time now for questions, and um, there's a poll really quickly. Uh, just about the knowledge that you gained today. Um, Nick, if you want to pull that over. So we appreciate your feed, your initial feedback. Um, if you were able to gain some knowledge today, we appreciate that. Um, we appreciate Pat very much for sharing her time and her knowledge. Um, and just to go very deep into some of these questions about how we serve tribal youth and our differing perspectives on what those goals are. Uh, for our community and how we want to develop and support tribal youth um, through effective codes and laws and practices. And so with that, if you have, um, thank you all for your feedback. Uh, if you all have questions or comments, we do have a few minutes left. And so as soon as we close this poll out, uh, the question and answer pod will be available to you. And we'll go ahead and do that now. Um, just to leave time to respond. So questions about any of the topics today, questions about this series. Um, I know that a couple of you uh, were able to ask questions last time, um, and we responded to you after um, the meeting. So if you think of something in the interim, uh, you can feel free to email us, and we can respond to those during the next session. We did have a comment uh, during the webinar, and we can revisit that really quickly. Um, it was discussing rehabilitative um, and treatment resources that um, really came from adult resources. And so um, there was some commentary that they were limited and um, that most people didn't have access to these types of services. And I believe that Dr. Paulette Running Wolf, who's part of our team, had shared on that. Um, were, did you have any additional comments on that, um, Paulette? Or Pat, any comments on um, the development of, of systems? Really, that we've we've talked on that quite quite a bit about you know that we really tried to pull things from the adult system that we're seeing now um, weren't as applicable as we thought for youth populations, um, and that's obviously for developmental and all the other reasons that we talked about today. <clears throat> yeah, I definitely agree with that statement. Um, also, uh, my husband is a, is a physician, and I see that um, wealthy Americans have access to all kinds of modalities and sort of cutting edge interventions that the average person doesn't, and definitely we don't through our tribal systems. So often I feel like we're maybe not getting the state of the art stuff that's tailored for girls or boys or um, natives or, you know, it's hard to stay on top of all of that. Um, and certainly in the juvenile healing to wellness court context, we took the adult criminal 
juvenile hearing for wellness court model and we slap that onto the juvenile system and we haven't fully tailored it yet mm -hmm. and brought it up to Right. That, I feel like this is the perfect series where um, you can take all of these concepts that we're talking, and if you're just at the beginning of developing your juvenile healing to wellness court, you know, these are perspectives that you can take into the policy development, which is exactly why we're offering this course and um, why I'm so appreciative of Pat um, being able to be on this series. So um, I know that many of you are, are are going to have to go. We're winding down, and so our webinar survey link is at the bottom, and we will be here again on June 28th, and so if you think of anything between now and then, please feel free to reach out to us at the TTA Center. My email is there below, or you can reach directly out to Pat, and she'll address any comments or questions that come up between now and our next session. So with that, we will see you on Thursday, June 28th at 1 o'clock Central. Thank you so much, you all, for joining us. Um, have a good rest of your week and a good weekend. Thank you.